Hello and welcome to this video on the changing interpretations of the Cold War, the final video of the interpretations before we look at the end of the Cold War. So let's get stuck in. So historical controversy 2, 4.2. Uh, there are four views that you need to know about. The US Orthodox view, the US Revisionist review, uh, the Post Revisionist review and the New Cold War which is 1989 to present. So the story is uh, initially we start to blame the US, uh, the Soviet Union this is revised in the 1960s and mid-70s. Now, at the same time, there is a, a combination, a post-revisionist view, and after the end of the Cold War, our view changes. So let's get into the first one. The US Orthodox view, the Soviet Union was to blame. Now, this predominantly was based on uh, the aggressive expansion by Soviet leaders. They wanted to spread communism through the world. There are three main factors that kind of build towards this. Uh, this view. So we've got the Red Scare, so in the 1920s and the 1950s there is uh, fear of communism in, in America. In the 1950s Senator Joseph Car McCarthy capitalises on this fear. He claims that many members of the US government uh, are communists and other institutions are full of Soviet spies. Intellectuals were accused of being communist sympathisers and the same thing happened or similar things happened in Britain. Uh, historians monitored the intelligence services uh, uh, sorry people were monitored by the US intelligence services and at this point there is a lot of fear around communism and of course communism and the Soviet Union are intrinsically linked there's also the personal experience of the Cold War for example historians at the time Kennan was a US government official uh, so that influences his policy. He has to support what he's been doing. We've got uh, other personal experiences as well. Lastly, there's the lack of sources. In the 1940s to the 1960s, you've got US documentation and that's it. But even US documentation itself is sensitive and secretive and it was hugely influenced by pop propaganda. The p general public, many historians, only had access to what was allowed to them. Uh, there are historians Thomas Bailey, George Kennan, Herbert Feist are all the traditional approaches, what we call the US Orthodox. Now the impact of this view, uh, it was widely accepted by historians and politicians for most of the Cold War and it was accepted by the US public. The US public had been mainly influenced by films such as War of the Worlds or Make Mind Freedom. Make Mind Freedom itself was a propaganda tool. It did suffer some challenges, notably from the USSR patriotic Soviets uh, they were officially censored as well so if anything that anything they produced criticized uh, the USSR and their involvement then they would not be published and they themselves had a lack of access so USA very much perpetrated this view that the USSR were the aggressors and that they were defending their interests in Europe Soviets historians on the other hand were claiming that the USA were the aggressors and they were just defending their interests in Europe. There were some challenges from the USA, notably from William Appleman Williams, who argued the USA were the aggressor, um, and British historian H. Carr, who also criticised it. Now this view comes from what was given to people at the time. So you imagine in the 1940s we've got the Soviet expansion into Eastern Europe and that heavily influences many people's decisions. They continued to have communist governments in each of these countries despite what was promised at Potsdam and so this heavily influenced people's views. It had a big impact as it lasted such a, a long time although there were some challenges. Now we move on to the second view, which is the US revisionist view. So in the 1960s and the 1970s, historians started to come out of the woodwork that said that actually the aggressive actions of the USA allowed the Cold War to start. And they particularly pointed towards the aggressive actions in Europe and Asia. So what were they? Well, in, uh, in Europe, we've got the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine promised intervention for any government that was threatened by communism. I don't know a bigger marker that could have a red flag for the Soviet Union. And secondly, we've got the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was aid that was going to help post-war -econo uh, post economic depression. Now, all of this benefited the USA, and they only gave money to US democratic and capitalist countries. They refused to help those with different ideologies, and we can indicate the 
the actions in Hungary in the Hungarian uprising and the lack of support that America gave, this would have provoked the USSR. Um, we've got things that influence the views in the 1950s and 60s. We've got the Cuban Revolution in 1959 that puts communism at the door of the USA. And of course, we've got the Vietnam War. Thousands of soldiers are being killed and public opinion turns against the Cold War and turns against, turns against uh, actions that they're doing. When it's turn, when 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 American public realise that there are these large bombing raids, we've got Agent Orange and other napalm, etc. It has a profound impact on the trust of the US government. And we have to point to the Miley massacre as well and the Kent State shooting. So there's these huge events going on that start to challenge the views. The impact among historians, the revisionism starts to cause a stir. As one historian puts it, they created very rough seas for those sailing in the orthodox traditionalist boat. Politicians were very hesitant and disliked this theory as it made them seem that they were the aggressors and public in, uh, opinion was disliked. Some older people felt, felt they were uncomfortable with this view as it was unpatriotic, whereas some of the young, who were those involved in the protest movements against the Vietnam War, believed in it and started to support it. There was criticism though and challenges by traditionalist historians for example Thomas G Patterson uh, described how traditionists re reacted to his and other um, tradition and other uh, revisionist works uh, when he submitted his PhD um, he was told not to do it it was it would ruin his career when he published uh, in the Hi historical review there were a number of emotional historians that came out contradicting what he'd said um, when he lectured at a military academy some say that he was unpatriot unpatriotic and he was shunned particularly for his views so our third view is our post revisionist which is they just couldn't understand each other the cold war was caused by the way the usa and the ussr reacted to the different actions and this is the early 70s until the early uh, to the mid uh, 1989 or so so ignore the dates at the top as that's incorrect it's early 1970s to 1989 Cold War was based on mistrust. Uh, the proponent here is a historian called John Lewis Gaddis. He takes the most relevant and plausible elements of orthodoxy and revision and, and combines them. And he argues that the Cold War was not inevitable. He argues that some blame is on Stalin, some blame is on the USA. But it's the both of them. It's a result of fear, confusion and misunderstanding. Now this comes from historical debate. It causes huge debate among historians. It comes from different historians challenging the views. And as well as in the 1970s, we've got the detente, better relations. After the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon and uh, as his successors pro uh, begin this thawing of relations, improving relations. They build better ties with China. They build better ties with the USSR. They agree the, uh, the salt talks in 1972. They meet at Helsinki to discuss, to discuss human rights. And so, of course, these better relations start to impact how hist historians view the Cold War at this time and the causes of it. You've got to remember there's also the Apollo-Soyuz mission, the first time that America and Russia meet in space in a friendly gesture. We've got the, uh, the daton in general. Now, there were historians that challenged this view. We've got Eisenberg, who argued it was the orthodox view with just a few archive references thrown in, that it was dressed up, and it was something that it wasn't. Now, our fifth, uh, sorry, our fourth view from, is the new Cold War, which starts with the end of the Cold War to present. So as we had access now to more US documents as the USSR collapsed, and we also gained access to the USSR's archive, we had new information. Gaddis remember Gaddis was the post revisionist view in the 1970s changes his view and actually puts far more blame on uh, Stalin so revert to an orthodox view he blames it on Stalin's personality his authority as well as the ideology of communism and he claims that it was an authoritarian government that caused it so it was Stalin's a uh, cult of personality that drove many many leaders in Europe to follow him. For instance, Rakoshi. We've got in Hungary. 
we've got the th the ideology of communism that, that uses secret secretism, um, the secret police and militarism to control. Now the context of this event, well we've got the end of the Cold War, that leads to new Soviet sources, but we've also got a second factor, Ronald Reagan as President of the United States. He pursues a much more uh, hardline approach to the, U to the USSR. He calls them the evil empire and he really ignites a second Cold War. This causes polarization of views. Some people turn towards him and say that we need to find information to support what Ronald Reagan says. And then there's also historians that disagree and say that actually, no, it was still the USA that was aggressive and they found views that supported that information. Now, we believe that new information would reveal a final interpretation, but in fact, it's just caused more controversy. So uh, he, British historians such as Michael Cox and Caroline Kennedy Pipe say that it was a combination of the two. Whereas historians such as Mervyn Leffler and Geddes have changed it to more focus on Stalin. So those are the four interpretations and hopefully you've gained an idea of how they've changed over time. So we've got how to answer the questions again. So question one is very much about evaluation of the interpretation, just how strong it is, compare it to other views, um, compare it to your own knowledge. You must make sure you are doing these four th these things. Now question four is comparison. Can you tell the story of how the Cold War changed? So we've got the orthodox approach that very much blames the USSR, and that's the, because of the USA's involvement, uh, because many of the historians were USA gov uh, US government officials or linked to it, or they only had access to information that was given to them. The USSR was a very secretive state behind the Iron Curtain, um, and that causes their view to sort of stagnate. In the 1960s, because of the Vietnam War, because of the way the Cold War was going, there's the revisionist approach that gives a portion of blame to both sides. Then we've got the post-revisionist approach that says actually it was based on misunderstanding, mistrust, that this Cold War was not inevitable, the proponent being Gaddis and others. And then we've got, at the end of the Cold War, how the events then start to change our views. New information um, starts to impact, as well as Ronald Reagan and his factor. Now, there's a way to answer this question. Now, over to you. For 4.2, there's a couple of examples here. We've got US historian Gaddis in 1997, who really does um, say that it's the combination of the USA's approach that wants a form of security that rejects violence up against Stalin's approach that causes the Cold War and says that it was unavoidable. US historian Kennan, writing in 1957, uh, really does apportion a lot of blame. And just look at the language that he uses. Strange corruption of the communist mind, incapable of distinguishing between fact and, in, uh, fact and fiction in any film. They have always lied to us and will continue to lie to us about us. So you can have a go at these two questions in answering the interpretations on the Cold War. Just remember the events and try to use those in your answer, and I think it will have a well-rounded approach. Good luck.